I live in Freiburg in Breisgau. I'm biased, but I think it's one of the most beautiful cities in all of Germany. We have stunning medieval towers providing entrance into our charming old town, an area with quaint cobbled streets paved with stones from the Rhine, colorful, charming shops, and a Gothic cathedral with spires that rise up towards the Black Forest. And we have these big, beautiful, dumb boxes. Oh yeah, marvel at them. No, 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 seriously, marvel at them because these are the buildings that might just save our planet and our communities in the process. When I worked in the architecture industry in the United States, big dumb boxes were exactly what I was taught to avoid. Every new building our firm designed had jogs, pushes and pulls and colors to try to give it some variety. So imagine my culture shock when I moved to Europe and saw these big boxy white buildings dominating every newly developed neighborhood but simple is better for many reasons. As architect Mike Eliasson, the one who first wrote in Praise of Dumb Boxes puts it, dumb boxes are the least expensive, the least carbon intensive, the most resilient, and have some of the lowest operational costs compared to more varied and intensive massing. There are so many ways that dumb boxes aren't actually so dumb after all and we should all be paying attention to them. So, let's take a look. One of my favorite architectural comics of all time is this one. And I love it because I feel like no matter what industry you happen to work in, you can probably relate to it. The stages of design often means that creativity is sacrificed in the name of efficiency, cost, and code. But I would argue that the original concept was just terrible design in the first place. Designers today are routinely indoctrinated against the dumb box. Even advertising urges us to think outside the box. Why? Because it is a thought we all hate that the box is just too dumb, too boring, and after all, we all just need to escape it in pursuit of individuality. And don't get me wrong, I can appreciate design that seeks to elevate and inspire and even border on whimsy. I don't think design has to be boring, but every time a building has to turn a corner, costs are added. New details are required, more flashing, more materials, more complicated roofing. Each move has a corresponding cost associated with it. And the more costs that are added into our buildings in the name of creativity, the more ultimately those costs have to be passed down to the end consumer. Sometimes those consumers are renters and this could mean that the apartments you seek to rent can be wholly out of reach. But additional requirements like height setbacks, for example, also have the same effect. In the US, before we had zoning ordinances, the restrictions on building form were far and few between. And honestly, if you take a look at turn of the century buildings, the vast majority of them are simple boxes. The facade isn't modulated, there aren't awkward recesses, and these buildings weren't encumbered with setback requirements. Of course, it makes sense that builders built in this manner. It was the most cost-effective and allowed the builder to make flourishes on the street side facade if desired or if your budget allowed. And in very much the same way, this was also the motivation for historical buildings which have been constructed in Europe as well. I mean, take a look at these two buildings, constructed in two wildly different architectural styles in very different parts of the continent. But if you take away the flourishment, they're really just both boxes. And fast forward to today, because of these setback requirements and modulation requirements that we add to low and mid-rise buildings in order to make them seem less boxy, we've also added a heck of a lot of costs onto our projects. But big, dumb boxes like these in the Alten Guter Bahnhof Viertel in Freiburg are more affordable because they're able to maximize their footprint while minimizing intensive massing. 
Plus, they're often multi-use, multi-family buildings, which not only make neighborhoods walkable, but also accommodate a wider range of family types, family sizes, age groups, and income levels for an inclusive community. And don't get me wrong, Freiburg's housing costs are one of the highest in Germany. I often tell people that housing price per square foot or square meter here in Freiburg is really kind of on par with San Francisco in the United States. But take a look here as I pan across the neighborhood. One of these buildings is government subsidized social housing. A second is student housing, and a third offers luxury apartments for just under 1 million euros per unit. I bet you can't pick out which one is which. Oh, and uh, right around the corner is a retirement home, all in the same community. And ultimately, when we're discussing things like cost, it's incredibly important when we're looking at affordability something that is extremely hard to achieve in high-rise buildings. In Germany, buildings over 22 meters, floor over ground, are considered high-rises and have stricter regulations that lead to more costs. And there's a reason for that specific number. The largest rescue device standardized in Germany is a turntable ladder with a nominal rescue height of 23 meters. So in a high rise that's above 22 meters, you need a second egress flight corridor, which usually is a second egress stairwell, which leads to a larger unrentable inner functional core. And ultimately that is added cost that must be priced into the apartment rental costs. And in addition to all that, construction gets more expensive the higher you go up. Scaffolding, pumps, and cranes needed for this construction. And this leads to a sweet spot, around six-ish floors, where the construction price per flat tends to be the least, meaning that those apartments are also the most affordable to rent. Before we go any further, I wanna give a big thank you to the sponsor of today's video, My Heritage. MyHeritage is the number one family history and DNA service in Europe, and they make exploring your family history easier than ever. I recently partnered with them to learn more about my ancestry, and the entire process was so intuitive. They mailed the DNA kits directly to my door, and after a simple two-minute cheek swab, I mailed off the sample to their lab for results. And if you caught our earlier video, you'll see that the results were so surprising. The MyHeritage DNA test is unique, not only helping me to connect with distant and close relatives across the globe through shared DNA, but also revealing my ethnicity estimates and our percentage breakdown across 42 supported ethnicities and 2,114 geographic regions. In addition to DNA testing, MyHeritage also offers a platform that makes it easy to build your family tree and research your family history. MyHeritage is committed in its privacy policy to never sell or license genetic data, so you can feel safe and protected while exploring the very essence of what makes you, you. And if you want to buy your own kit, MyHeritage has a promotion going on right now. So click the link below and use the code Ashton to get free shipping. But understanding the role that development costs play in the total equation is actually quite complicated. And importantly, development costs don't actually increase in linear tandem with the size of the building, nor does it actually increase in this sort of linear line with the number of units that are contained within a building. It's more of a stair-step function. There's a certain point where the cost jumps because different materials or construction techniques must be used or different regulations apply. For example, the materials you use for the structure of the building will often dictate the fire resistance rating of the building, which then dictates the allowable height of the building. And while the use of something like thin shell concrete over wood frame construction, which is what dominates in the United States, for example, can move the construction type from 5A to 1A, meaning the height of the project is no longer limited to four stories on grade or four stories above a podium. And yeah, I'm sorry, I'm using a lot of industry terms here, but the point I'm trying to make is that we really need to be asking ourselves if bigger is really better. There's a reason why all of these dumb boxes in Germany tend to kind of hover around the same size to one another. And a lot of it comes down to reduced operating costs. Dump boxes are great from an energy consumption standpoint because they're more efficient, owing to lower surface area to volume ratio over buildings with more intensive floor plans. And yeah, sorry guys, 
Sometimes size really does matter. If your big dumb box is too big, it will either be a deep plan needing increased artificial lighting or air conditioning, or a complicated shape that will facilitate daylighting, but increase surface area and heat losses. Or if your dumb box is too tall, it will require more structural material and lifts. So the vast majority of dumb boxes in Germany are six stories and under. And again, there's a reason for this from an operational standpoint. Older boxes did so because they predate the elevator and more modern engineering methods that made skyscrapers possible. But newer boxed buildings under six stories are advantageous because they can be manageable in long periods without power, where tall skyscrapers are problematic under the same conditions. And a neighborhood of dense, dumb boxes only increases that resilience. Now, my next point seems quite obvious, but dumb boxes are actually the least carbon intensive. As I mentioned in the previous section, the more jogs and bumps, the more surface area and the more material needed to cover it and hold it up. That's a lot of unnecessary embodied energy. According to the International Energy Agency, the manufacture of construction materials is responsible for around 10% of global energy related CO2 emissions. So oftentimes the best carbon solutions we can make are the ones where that decision is made from the very beginning. Timing is almost everything. The decisions made during the earliest phase of a construction project will define the emissions of a building in its lifetime. If we're going to build affordable green housing and sustainable public buildings, we have to keep it simple and plan with that in mind from the very beginning. Because if you try to hit the standard after the fact, it just ends up costing you more money. Perhaps that's why I eventually bucked the American design standards and fell in love with these big dumb boxes. Their passive design means that they tend to be relatively simple to minimize surface area and eliminate jogs and bumps that can be thermal bridges. And the truth is, whether you're designing a house or a concert hall, there's a carbon price to be paid every time you get fancy. <laughs> and the truth of the matter is, even here in Freiburg, we don't always get it right. In fact, we have a very painful example of this, just about a 20 minute bike ride away from the Altenguter Bahnhof Viertel in the city center itself. And that's the university library. In early 2006, the construction of a new library was initiated by an architectural design competition, and the winner was a firm from nearby Basel. And the design for the newly constructed building was supposed to hold 1,200 workspaces in four reading rooms, as well as 500 work areas. At the same time, it was supposed to have 60 to 70% of the energy costs of the former building, saving the university around 700,000 euros per year. Unfortunately, if cost savings is what they were after, eh, it certainly isn't what they got. For starters, the wavy undulating exterior means that the building requires a sizable amount more exterior cladding, despite being 20% smaller in volume than the previous building. And although the design touted lower energy costs, they curiously decided to clad the building in 7,300 square meter facade of glass and matted dark chrome steel panels. A decision, quite frankly, that has plagued the design from the get-go. Immediately after installing the facade, traffic participants were blinded by the reflection of the low settled sun in the southeast corner in the spring or the autumn. And so now this corner has to be covered up with this, um, interesting sun sale during this period of time. The same exterior metal sheets then started leaking water when it rained and falling off the building altogether. Thankfully, no one was injured by this Final Destination-esque building hazard, but it did require the entire facade to be replaced under warranty. And the secondary entrance, which was necessary for accessibility means, didn't even properly open because the wall it sat on wasn't vertical. Now, listen, I don't mean to completely rail on this design team, but this entire building just seems so unnecessarily complicated. I mean, especially for a city that prides itself on being a sustainability powerhouse within Germany and trying to model itself after good sustainable design practices, it's really curious to me that they would build a building 
completely with an entire glass facade, particularly when sustainability experts in academia have been screaming for decades that this is exactly what we should be avoiding. The original designers of the university library argue that this type of design is not a traditional glass skyscraper of the past, and that by utilizing a technology-focused solution with glazed layers and windows that open for fresh air, that you can essentially design your way out of an inconvenient problem. But the design they sold to the city of cutting down on cooling costs quite frankly, isn't enough, in my opinion, to redeem these glass structures. Sure, this facade is designed to reduce cooling load, but the problem with it is that it's very high in embodied energy. Even without the leaks and the freakish falling panels, the glazing needs to be replaced every 30 to 40 years, and that creates a big carbon problem. Those glass panels are stuck together with plastic, so even recycling them is extraordinarily difficult. And listen, if we're ever truly going to get a handle on our CO2 emissions, we're probably going to need to stop building these massive glass buildings with these weird, funny shapes and bumps and jogs. And, I, you know, you might love this design, you might hate this design, but ultimately, sustainable architecture might mean that we need to reassess what we term beautiful architecture in the first place. And that's why I really feel that from a material durability standpoint, as well as a resilience in the face of climate change or natural disaster standpoint, dumb boxes can be the most resilient. Every time a corner or a recess or other facade modulation is introduced into a building, the chances of issues related to weathering, durability, and building movement increase. Leaks seldom occur in the middle of a roof's flat surface or field in roofing terms. Rather, they tend to develop in the nooks and crannies formed where roof planes intersect or where roofs abut walls. Hence, the simpler design, the fewer the intersections, the less likelihood of leaks. Really subtle shifts in plane can also result in complicated details that are expensive to replace over the lifetime of a building. But resilience, particularly within the world of sustainability, isn't always necessarily about the longevity of the materials used within the building envelope, but also the resilience that that building creates for the entire community. Many urbanists, especially those who dislike tall buildings, are eager to point out that a city can have dense transit-oriented development without having a lot of tall buildings. After all, most of central Paris, for example, is dominated by four, five-story buildings. Yet Paris is actually denser than New York City, and the older parts of Berlin and Amsterdam have a very similar urban fabric. This dense urban fabric is what makes it possible to have infrastructure and shops where you live, eat, and work near your home. And not to mention, living that closely together saves a ton of energy and transportation, heating, and reduces sprawl. And by doing so, it protects the natural and agricultural landscape, all thanks to dumb boxes. Now, I get it. I know that from a design standpoint, these big boxes aren't necessarily for everybody. But I really think that efficient, resilient design like this is quite frankly that missing middle that is missing in a lot of North American cities. And so whether you're on board with the design or even if we could just adopt a few of the elements of it, I think that there's a lot that we could learn from these big dumb boxes right here in Germany. Because I really do think there's a type of architecture that I've grown to love. In fact, the house I'm filming this in, the house we bought, is one of those dumb boxes. And I think it's pretty great but I would love to hear from you down in the comment section below. What do you think of this design? And what do you think should be the future of architecture, particularly when we're looking in the face of climate change and sustainability and community? So please let me know down in the comment section below. And as always, if you enjoyed what you saw today, be sure to hit that thumbs up button. And for more content from Type Ashton, hit that subscribe button. So I'll see you next Sunday. Tschüss!